George Clooney is what we like to think ourselves as at our best. He's bringing old Hollywood back to new Hollywood. You know, a little bit of uh, Clark Gable, um, a little bit of Montgomery Cliff. He experienced great failure and disappointment, frustration with his career. He couldn't get a hit. He couldn't get on a movie. Clooney became a household name by starring in ER. Everyone all of a sudden started to really pay attention to him. Bill O'Reilly essentially called him a traitor to this country. When George Clooney says that he's interested in helping in Darfur, he isn't just writing a check. He'll get on the plane, try to get himself killed. Clooney will be able to play the complex heroes of tomorrow's movies because he's lived it. Although George Clooney is one of the most recognizable celebrities of the 21st century, his classic good looks and undeniable charm harken back to the Hollywood of old, earning him the unofficial title of the last movie star. I think George Clooney is in many ways like the perfect film star. I mean, he's, he's really almost like a throwback to the past when Hollywood used to make perfect film stars on an almost you know, weekly basis. He's the kind of movie star that we had before television, although the irony is he comes out of television. When you see him, he evokes memory of uh, Cary Grant or Clark Gable, Gary Cooper. He brings a certain elegance and, and gravity, almost a um, like a sort of a patina of celebrity that too often new stars don't have. They're ephemeral, they're shallow, they'll blow away. They don't have the voice that he has. There is no doubt that today, George Clooney is an American icon but he worked long and hard to gain his current star power. The guy who can do no wrong in his 40s could do nothing right in his 20s. And very few who knew him then could foresee greatness in his future. I mean, most actors come to Hollywood, they hit it in their 20s. George Clooney, even though everything seems so effortless for him now, he struggled for a long time in Los Angeles playing bit roles. There's probably an entire room of some Hollywood studio that's just filled with, you know, failed uh, George Clooney TV shows. I mean, he was the absolute pilot king. I mean, he was, you know, he had pilots like most people have breakfast. Basically, L.A. is made up of losers. It's made up of people who couldn't make it anywhere else. He couldn't disappoint his parents any more than he had. Everybody thought he was a loser, and he just couldn't make the cut at anything. There comes a point where you, do, you reach the end of your ability to explain away failure. George Timothy Clooney's long journey from L.A. failure to Hollywood's A-list started in Lexington, Kentucky, when on May 6, 1961, local news personality Nick Clooney and his wife Nina gave birth to their second child. George Clooney is uh, who his parents are and where he comes from. He's born in Kentucky. He's near Cincinnati. His mother was a beauty pageant winner. His father, a broadcaster, a game show host. But every time I've talked to George Clooney, and I've done that plenty in the last decade, uh, the conversation always goes to mom and dad. To his father, he's endlessly referring to him about some values that he's given him. When people use the word class, his class refers to breeding. And you either have it or you don't. And his father is a gentleman. When George was a kid growing up with his sister, his father would say, who's Martin Luther King? Uh, Who's John F. Kennedy? Who's anybody else that's doing something in the world and they had to answer and they had to do book reports, forget school. And I said, how old were you when this started? And he said, six. And I said, six? You had to answer those questions about it? And he said, this is the home I grew up in. This is why I'm in everybody's face now. In addition to current affairs, the Clooney children got a lesson in the fickle nature of celebrity and fame. His father, uh, when George was young, had a fight with um, the local TV station he was on uh, because they wouldn't give him the amount of money he wanted for his salary, and he'd earned it. He deserved it. He brought up ratings. He was worth it. And they wouldn't do it, and he walked out. And the result is the family had no money for a year, and he got a job working in a, a community theater somewhere around Cincinnati. And they lived in a house trailer. I think his respect for his father comes from that, that his father, uh, at certain points in his life, out of principle, has put, a, put everything on the line. George looked up to his father, but he had no plans to follow in his footsteps as a media personality. He was more interested in sports. By high school, George was on his way to becoming a popular jock. 
until he came down with Bell's palsy. Bell's palsy is a, is a kind of paralysis that happens in the um, ear canal, and it produces paralysis of the face. And half his face, a little kid, when how you look is important, and half his face was paralyzed. And uh, all the other kids made fun of him. It created this sense that he was outside of the group. Um, this sense of not being really with it and he compensated or overcompensated with that by being the jokester or the one to make fun of his own tremors or what happened. The thing about Clooney that I think is is unique and a very good looking person is that he is incredibly self-deprecating. He really is a guy who who doesn't take his physical package you know seriously. That's very hard for any actor to actually do. Actors get noticed for how they look but I think because of the fact that when he was quite young, he was stricken with something that, you know, affected his face, and he had to make fun of that and be easy with that, that he's always been a guy with a great sense of humor about himself. George not only recovered from his ailments, but he used his charm and looks to become quite the ladies' man. His dreams of becoming a professional athlete, on the other hand, were squashed by a hard dose of reality when he tried to make the Cincinnati Red squad. George's desire was totally to be a baseball player. He thought he was just so hot. And he had a tryout for the Cincinnati Reds, and he loves to tell the story of the 85-mile-an-hour pitch coming at him where he just ducked and ran the other way and fell and then looked at himself and the people laughing at him and said, I will never be a professional ball player. It's over now. Uh, his cousin, Miguel Ferrer, who is a son of uh, Rosemary Clooney, his aunt, and Jose Ferrer, the actor, uh, was the one who said, you know, you should come to L.A. and try out for acting. You might be good at that. Having dropped out of Northern Kentucky University and earning a living by chopping tobacco, Clooney decided to take up Miguel's offer. In 1982, at 21 years old with $300 in his pocket, Clooney packed up his Monte Carlo and headed west with plans of living with his aunt Rosemary and working as her driver till he hit the big time. Rosemary Clooney, George Clooney's aunt, was a big factor in grounding him when he first went out to Hollywood. I mean, Rosemary Clooney was this big singer, but once rock and roll hit it big and her lounge act kind of singing wasn't that popular anymore, she ceased to be famous. So he always took that with a grain of salt. He's like, you can be famous one minute and you're never as famous as you necessarily think you are. He sort of unloaded himself on her at an awful moment in her life. They had a certain amount of difficulty over the fact that he wasn't quite the manservant that he, she thought he ought to be since he was giving him room and board. Uh, and he said he was using his car, her car to go out with his friends and to go, by, and go to auditions. George didn't find much acting work, but that didn't stop him and his cousin Miguel from partying all around Hollywood. After months of his freeloading, Rosemary had enough. She kicked him out. He ended up living in the closet of his friend, Tom Matthews, who's one of his best friends. Still is. And, um, they, you know, so they took a mattress, put it on the floor of this walk-in <laughs> walk closet. And that's where he lived for like a year. They had no money at all. And so he'd take the bus every day. He had no car, which means you got to wait two hours for a bus and then make it transfers another five hours. It was during this period of failed audition after failed audition that Clooney had an epiphany a realization about Hollywood that to this day he credits with his success. He said, it occurred to me one day, if I get the job or I don't get the job, it doesn't matter because I'll get back on the bus, go back to the closet. They have the problem. Their problem is they've got to cast a movie or a TV show or a play, and the damn thing has to start shooting in a week. Well, that's their problem. I'm the answer to their problem. And so and he said it was like you know, suddenly the dawn came and he suddenly realized they're not doing me any favors. I'm doing them the favor. I'm the guy getting on the damn bus and going all the way over. He started seeing rejection as they're a bunch of idiots. It was attitude trumping reality. Guest spots on network shows shortly followed. Then in 1984, a 23-year-old George Clooney was cast on a new television show about a Chicago hospital called ER. E slash R it was a situational comedy set in a hospital, um, not to be confused with his later drama hit, ER. George was sure that this was the break he needed to propel him to stardom. In 1984, George Clooney was a 23-year-old with no car, living in a friend's closet. 
However, after two years of struggling in Hollywood, he got the call he hoped would change his life. His agent informed him he was cast as one of the leads on a new television show about a Chicago hospital called ER. Not to be confused with his later drama hit, ER. E slash R is a situational comedy set in a hospital that lasted for only 22 episodes and was then canceled, but it was his first big break into television. ER failed to make Clooney a household name, but it did lead to guest roles on Golden Girls and Murder, She Wrote and semi-regular roles on Facts of Life and the ABC hit Roseanne. He was also getting work in low-budget horror flicks like The Return to Horror High and Return of the Killer Tomatoes. All right, look, just for the sake of argument, let's suppose she's a tomato. Let's go so far as to suppose that she's here. How you gonna tell one tomato from another? Both his profile and his pay scale rose. But Clooney wasn't happy playing secondary characters in third-rate fare. If he seems like he's floundering in these early horror movies, it's because he is floundering. The guy's trying to fit into a, a, a Hollywood at the time, which is not exactly geared for people like George Clooney. We're talking about the age of the action hero. Um, the mid-80s, the late 80s. This is high Arnold period, I guess you could say, and, and uh, Bruce Willis and Die Hard. And so Clooney, who I think becomes more substantial and more handsome as he grows up, he's just not quite there yet. He's not an action hero, and he's not, he's not fitting the Hollywood mold. He was very happy that he was making hundreds of thousands of dollars every year from these sitcoms, but he was still a relative unknown. He couldn't get a hit. And for someone who really felt like acting was their passion, it was still very disappointing. While Clooney was becoming increasingly frustrated and despondent with his unstable career, he tried to find stability in his personal life. He took his modest savings and purchased a home in the Hollywood Hills and settled down with his girlfriend, a then up and coming Kelly Preston. Back in his early years in Hollywood, George dated Kelly Preston, Mrs. John Travolta, and the two ended up buying a house together, and he even got her a pet pig named Max as a present. I mean, his house is built into the side of this canyon, so it's very difficult to get away from the pig. You know, pigs aren't quiet, and they smell. And if you didn't know he owned a pig, when you walked in the door, you'd know he owned a pig. <laughs> and he finds it charming. Whether she was unhappy living with a pig or with George, Kelly Preston didn't stick around long. When she moved out, George became increasingly disheartened about his failures in life and love and returned to the arms of an ex, Talia Balsam, whom he dated in 1984. She's a young actress, and she was heavily involved with another guy. And this again is typical of Clooney. And he just fell head over heels for her. Just months after Kelly Preston broke his heart, Clooney packed Talia, her mother, and several friends into a Winnebago bound for Las Vegas. On December 15, 1989, a 28-year-old George and Talia Balsam were wed by an Elvis impersonator in a marriage that seemed doomed from the start. He blames himself for it, and he didn't, he didn't make a sufficient amount of effort to make the marriage work and I think it's because I think he took it for granted marriage is a process and he didn't and he saw it as an event he chooses to be down in the casino with his friends sitting up all night gambling. <laughs> I mean it's it you know it's like well that's that's done I've taken care of that now let's get on with my being a boy after the wedding George's career showed little advancement he was cast in failed pilots and short-lived series like baby talk while he was rejected for roles like Mr. Blonde in Reservoir Dogs and the Cowboy Drifter in Thelma and Louise, roles that propelled others to stardom. The truth was that he'd kind of been fumbling through Hollywood for more than a decade. He enjoyed a lot of financial success on different sitcoms, but he never was a breakout star, and he didn't really have an opportunity to work on a project that he loved. George was 100% focused on making it, and he gave very little time or effort to his wife. After three years of playing second fiddle to his career ambitions, Talia and George divorced, leaving him with Max and a bleeding stomach ulcer. His marriage to Talia Balsam didn't work out, and, and, and it was traumatic. Since then, he is, you know, pretty clear about the fact that he is not going to remarry, he is not going to have children, that's not who he is. While the divorce was traumatic at the time, in typical Clooney fashion, he was later able to turn his sworn bachelorhood into something of a joke. 
George Clooney's divorce was so bad for him that he said, look, I'm never going through this again. I couldn't do it the right way the first time, so I'm not even gonna try. And he made a bet with his co-stars, Michelle Pfeiffer and Nicole Kidman, that by the age of 40, he wouldn't be married and he wouldn't have kids. It's a $10,000 bet on both of their parts. And when he turned 40, still not married, still no kids, they both sent him a check. He sent it back to both of them and said, look, double or nothing. Give me till I'm 50. Jokes and bets with leading ladies were in the future. In 1994, Clooney was still almost famous, almost making it. After 12 years in Los Angeles, he was tired of just getting by. He needed to find the role that would finally give him the break he so desperately needed. From the carpenter in Facts of Life to the goofy pizza guy in Return of the Killer Tomatoes, George Clooney spent 12 years in Hollywood getting work, but not getting noticed. That all changed in 1994, when a 33-year-old Clooney landed the part of Dr. Doug Ross on the NBC ensemble drama, ER. They introduced a new type of TV show to some extent. It was very fast-paced, um, you know, very intricate storylines. It was like bang, 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 bang. All right, Oscar, what you got? 10 to 12, found unconscious. Big, serious, but you know, at, you know, at times emotional and and, and funny show, uh, and and Clooney was just you know right in the center of it. When he got the job on ER playing Dr. Doug Ross, he had second billing to Anthony Edwards. And he was supposed to play this kind of caddish doctor. But George talked directors into eventually giving a more serious side to Dr. Ross and ended up stealing the show. Thanks in no small part to Clooney's roguish charm, ER became an instant hit. Every Thursday night, millions of viewers tuned in to watch the doctors of Cook County General Hospital. And after 12 years in Hollywood, Clooney became a household name. This was certainly the role that made him a national, international uh, star and sex symbol. He was the network's big hot hunk to Noah Wiley's kind of like nerdy alternative hot guy. You know, you're kind of on one side or the other, Noah girl or a George girl. Once George was a hit on ER, of course the movie studios started calling. They started sending him scripts. Suddenly, the guy who used to take the bus to auditions was getting scripts couriered to his dressing room. For his first big film, Clooney played Seth Gecko opposite Hollywood wonder boy Quentin Tarantino in the action horror flick From Dusk Till Dawn, a role completely out of sync with his TV persona. From Dusk Till Dawn is an odd film. I mean, I'm a huge horror fan. I think that Clooney is, is really, really terrific in it, but it is an unusual role for this guy who's in a hospital drama to do. Let's cut to the chase. I'm going to ask you one question, and all I want is a yes or no answer. Do you want to live through this? Clooney sort of redesigns himself for this movie. He gets a new haircut, this sort of Roman Caesar type haircut, which I think he actually intended to be um, mean looking, sort of like the character was sort of, uh, uh, you know, a messed up person, like clipped off and not really concerned. But of course it becomes um, almost like a mini sensation. From Dusk Till Dawn did little business outside the midnight horror crowd. In an effort to play to Dr. Ross's female fans, Clooney's next trip to the silver screen went squarely in the opposite direction. So next Clooney tries a romantic comedy called One Fine Day, and it, it's really interesting. It pairs him with Michelle Pfeiffer, and you would think these two um, would really click, and it just didn't work. Despite none of his early films striking box office gold, the recently crowned Sexiest Man Alive was about to land the role of a lifetime. In 1995, Warner Brothers had a huge hit with Batman Forever and immediately greenlit a fourth installment of the blockbuster franchise called Batman and Robin. When star Val Kilmer had to bow out due to a scheduling conflict, the studio needed a new caped crusader and Clooney answered the call. There was a lot of hope for George Clooney to be the Batman. I think that like when you accept the role of Batman, you have to do or die with it. It's kind of like Bond, you know, it's like, Everything is going to fall on you if you do a great job or a bad job. If Clooney was feeling the pressures of carrying a $150 million picture, he kept it to himself. However, right before the biggest opening of his life, George learned not all was well in Gotham City. 
The night of the premiere, when they were showing the film to the press, he snuck up to the balcony and he said that he could feel the silence, that he could feel that people were not liking this movie. Batman and Robin should have been the career-making performance in some way because, you know, at the time, it was the biggest franchise in the world. Batman and Robin pretty much sunk it. I mean, the film was absolutely terrible. <laughs> Chicks dig the car. This is why Superman works alone. It reverted the, the movie to the TV show and made it much more campy. What you have is a director saying, wait, you know, where, where are all the primary colors and, you know, pink uh, nipples on bat suits? They put nipples on the bat suit. Clooney, you know, had this bat suit with nipples. Clearly, you know, the nipples on the Batman costume were not a good idea. Definitely. After Batman and Robin, I think a lot of actors, uh, especially actors that have come from TV, that might have been the end of their career, really. But there's something about Clooney that people could clearly see that he was a film star. You know, he just hadn't been in a film that anybody wanted to see. Over the long run, it's really worked well for Clooney because it's almost like his punchline. I actually thought that uh, Batman and Robin was the peak. <laughs> Clooney has since been able to laugh about the flop. But at the time, the fiasco forced him to take a hard look at his career. From the moment that he realized that Batman was a bad decision, his choices in movie roles have been impeccable. Thanks to his weekly ER paycheck, Clooney could afford to wait for the perfect movie. When he read the part of Jack Foley in Out of Sight, he knew he had found it. Not only was the script sharp, the project would pair Clooney with a director who, like Clooney, showed great promise, yet hadn't delivered a mainstream hit out of sight which I consider to be like the key pivotal George Clooney movie um, and he's terrific in it uh, you have both a star and a director writer in Steven Soderbergh who are reevaluating their careers this is also uh, Jennifer Lopez's uh, big role in movies she's extraordinary playing against George Clooney the chemistry in that film is terrific there's a scene very famously where they're locked in a car trunk together and you know the sparks fly you're in a bar I came up we started talking I wonder what would happen. Nothing. If you didn't know who I was. <laughs> You'd probably tell me. You say if we met in different circumstances. You have got to be kidding. A critical darling, but box office bust at the time, Out of Sight gained a massive audience on home video and is now considered one of the best films of the 90s. More importantly, Clooney proved to studios he had the goods to be a full-fledged movie star. But before conquering the Cineplex, Clooney had to say goodbye to the fans who first made him a star, the loyal viewers of ER. Dr. Ross's last episode of ER aired in February of 1999, and NBC milked it for all it was worth. It was huge. I mean, the show ER didn't end, but the hype around George Clooney leaving the show made his final episode feel like a real series finale. It's time to go. Where? I liked Seattle when I was in med school. I didn't see much of it, but I liked it. Seattle? The Pacific Northwest. Take that job offer in Portland. He, after a while, wasn't feeling as creatively juiced as he was in the beginning, but he made that character something that wasn't on the printed page. He was committed to the success of the show. Uh, he stayed there and fulfilled the contract. Totally uh, a George Clooney thing to do. With the ER behind him, Clooney was free to dive into film work full-time. For his next above-the-title role, Clooney picked the David O. Russell-helmed Three Kings, a heist flick set at the tail end of the first Gulf War. I'm talking about millions in Kuwaiti bullion. You mean them little cubes you put in hot water to make soup? No, not the little cubes you put in hot water to make soup. Clooney's strongest performance to date was almost overshadowed by a behind-the-scenes flare-up. David O. Russell was infamous for his harsh treatment of actors on set. When Clooney came across him berating an extra, he confronted the director. He felt that Russell was bullying people, and you know, if there's one theme in Clooney's life, he doesn't like a bully. I and mean, he's the first person to stand up to somebody and say, hey, look, you know, you've got to be nicer. You don't have to be a jerk to get what you want. The confrontation escalated, and Clooney and Russell came to blows in an onset brawl that made it into the entertainment press. I think uh, he and David Russell would like to keep punching each other in the face on a constant basis. 
And yet the movie, the thing that counts, the thing that's going to last and that we're watching, works tremendously well. With a one-two punch of Out of Sight and Three Kings, critics were convinced that Clooney had gotten over the ER hump and was a star of the silver screen. With the 2000 hit A Perfect Storm, Clooney proved he could open a blockbuster, and he put himself in the same league as Tom Cruise, Mel Gibson, and Tom Hanks. However, he turned his back on big paychecks in order to work with talent he admired. In this case, the sibling renegades of American film, Joel and Ethan Cohen. Any of you boys, Smithies? Or, if not Smithies per se, were you otherwise trained in the metallurgic arts before straightened circumstances forced you into life aimless wanderers? <laughs> Oh Brother is, is the point where Clooney really shows, I think, that what he is, possibly principally, is a light comedian. Again, I think the relationship between the Coen brothers and Clooney is, is another one that's central to his success. In 2001, just four years removed from the Batman disaster, a 40-year-old Clooney was growing more popular and more powerful with every project. Clooney and out-of-sight director Steven Soderbergh partnered up to form their own production company, called Section 8. Both men wanted to make a big splash right out of the gate. Knowing big names in bigger movies was the key to making Hollywood money men happy. Section 8 was prepared to deliver, in spades. This fantastic idea occurs to him to remake Ocean's Eleven, the Rat Pack movie. Ten ought to do it, don't you think? You think we need one more? You think we need one more? All right, we'll get one more. We got everybody in those movies. He called up every big name in Hollywood, Julia Roberts, Brad Pitt, Matt Damon, and got them to do this movie. So it really drew audiences to the box office because they couldn't wait to see how all these big names were going to be on screen together. Moviegoers fell in love with Ocean's Eleven, and the film became a worldwide sensation, earning big bucks for not only Section 8, but for the studio executives who greenlit projects. The money was nice, but Clooney and Soderbergh had earned a priceless Hollywood commodity, artistic freedom. It's long been uh, almost like an unwritten rule in Hollywood that if you make a bunch of money for a studio on one movie, then they'll probably let you make whatever you want for your next movie. What the Ocean movies meant was that they could do one of those films and then they could basically do what they wanted for the, for the film in between. Clooney and Soderbergh used their political capital to get several films made, including a remake of the 1960s Russian film Solaris and Clooney's directorial debut, Confessions of a Dangerous Mind, a film that didn't set the box office on fire, but did establish Clooney as a talent behind the camera. More importantly, Clooney cracked the Hollywood code of how to keep studios happy while delivering ideas as entertainment. And now that he could have his cake and eat it too, Clooney was eager to share. The business side for George Clooney extends past creating an environment for him to get movies made. He actually helps other people get movies made. And this is an amazing thing. And I said to a producer, what does George actually do, you know, as the executive producer? And they said, well, when we go into the studio asking for money and they say, no, we send George in. He's one of these people that goes to the room and you got, you know, <clears throat> three sharks in suits sitting at a studio and they're going to flim flam him like they do everybody else. And he walks out the door and he's wearing their underwear. And that's how he is. He's just, he's usually the smartest person in the room and he covers it well. Despite being one of the most powerful men in Hollywood, Clooney remained one of the most grounded. Part of this was due to the lessons on the fleeting nature of fame that he learned from his aunt and his father, as well as his own early struggles. Additionally, whenever he felt himself getting big-headed, he had the boys to knock him back to earth. Well, the boys are people he's known, are guys he's known a long time. I think with two exceptions, they're not in the business. One of the things he learned is that when you're in the movie business, you can't trust the word of anybody. Because in Hollywood, friendships are based strictly on usefulness. And so Clint was aware of that. So he keeps close to him. Guys he's known for 20 years, 25 years, who tell him the truth. It's like having your own little 
Kiwanis Club. They're his best friends. Um, he even said once when he was going to the Oscars, when he was nominated, that he was probably going to be late because he didn't want to miss his Sunday basketball game with the boys. By 2004, Clooney had reached the point in his career where he was nearly universally admired by those in the entertainment industry and the movie-going public. However, he was not without his detractors, one of whom became quite vocal after Clooney dipped his toe into the dangerous waters of politics. In 2004, George Clooney had established himself as a top talent and power player in Hollywood. That summer, he re-teamed with Steven Soderbergh and the rest of the Ocean's Eleven gang to film a highly anticipated sequel to the 2001 heist flick. Clooney was on top of the world, and as his celebrity profile rose, so did his political activism. I think that Clooney is trying to um, offset his popularity with a certain amount of weight. Um, social weight, political weight. Clooney's sense of civic duty had emerged in the early 90s during the race riots in South Central Los Angeles. Certain things happen where circumstance intervenes and you're forced to look. And once you've seen it, if you're decent, the viewing of it produces a sense of, of moral obligation. And that's what happened to George when he came down to his friends to try to clean things up. Throughout the 90s, George donated his time and money to various causes, but kept his views out of the public forum until he could no longer keep silent. In the wake of the September 11th terrorist attacks, he organized a telethon that featured some of Hollywood's biggest stars personally answering calls to collect donations. We wanted to show you a, a few of our friends that just showed up to answer the phones, take pledges. And all around the country, thousands of volunteers at phone banks are ready to take your calls. All calls made before 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time tomorrow will go to the September 11th Telethon Fund. 100% of the contributions will be used to benefit the victims and their families. That's very important, 100% of it. It raised millions for victims and families, an altruistic gesture that Fox News' Bill O'Reilly read as phony. He accused Clooney and his Hollywood friends of showing up for publicity but not following up to make sure the donations made it to the 9-11 victims' families. There are a lot of people in Hollywood, frankly, who take up causes or who uh, get on a soapbox. And I think for the great majority of Americans, uh, that sometimes is hard to take because these are obviously people who have enormous privilege and um, who may not know the world the way everyday people do. I think what's different about George Clooney is that when he speaks, it's clear. Uh, directly from his heart. Clooney fired off a letter to O'Reilly, accusing him of lying. As a result of the dispute, Clooney became a favorite target of O'Reilly and other conservatives, who pegged Clooney as the poster boy for the liberal Hollywood elite. When Clooney once again spoke from the heart and came out against the invasion of Iraq, some vocal conservatives stepped up the attacks. Clooney was very vocal about saying that he was against the war. And Bill O'Reilly essentially called him a traitor to this country, which upset Clooney greatly because he's always been very politically active and very involved in our country for the betterment of our country. And he couldn't believe that someone was attacking him in such a manner. I have a feeling that that whole encounter with Bill O'Reilly really hurt him. Um, and in a way, good night, good luck is a reaction to that. Fresh off the success of Ocean's 12, Clooney was once again in a position to make any movie he wanted. He ended up writing, producing, directing, and appearing in the most powerful and personal film of his career, Good Night and Good Luck. In Good Night and Good Luck, the pressure on journalism to kowtow to, at that time, Joe McCarthy and uh, the House Un-American Activities Committee is huge. And Clooney himself was feeling that pressure personally at the time where he was being vilified as a traitor in the press because of his feelings about the war and his sense of what a liberal is and thinking that he's supposed to keep his mouth shut because he's a movie star and no one wants to hear what a movie star is saying. Well, the best way I think a movie star can say anything is not running around giving a speech but making a movie like Good Night and Good Luck without having to underline the point that this 1950s movie was saying so much about the Bush world that he was living in at the time. We must not confuse dissent with disloyalty. 
We must remember always that accusation is not proof and that conviction depends upon evidence and due process of law. We will not walk in fear. We will not be driven by fear into an age of unreason if we dig deep in our history and our doctrine. And remember that we are not descended from fearful men, not from men who feared to write, to associate, to speak, and to defend the causes that were for the moment unpopular. Nobody would be doing this. At, at times, I often say to George, do you, does your management team often try to do an intervention? I don't think they do because they know what drives it. If Good Night and Good Luck was using the past to shine a light on the present, then George Clooney's role as a world-weary CIA agent in the Middle East thriller Syriana was very much about the petropolitics of the day. Despite the film's mixed reviews, Clooney ended up taking home the Oscar for Best Supporting Actor. An accolade Clooney earned the hard way. During the torture scene that he shot, he has this accident where he falls on the concrete floor and he really hurts himself in ways where after tests they didn't find out a while that he was leaking the spinal fluid out of his nose. He was suffering short-term memory loss. He will make very little of it now, but the fact is the repercussions of that accident are still with him. There's pain there, but he's not going to let that on. He's not going to say to people, oh, oh, look at what happened to me, I'm, look what I did. But the sense of him winning uh, the Oscar for that movie is really good for him as well because it's saying, I make this kind of movie. I, I, I'm going to continue to make this. Today, Clooney shows no signs of the horrific injury. And even those close to him are unsure of any long-term effects. It was another injury, this one suffered in New Jersey, that had gossip hounds buzzing not about Clooney's work, but about his private life. In 2007, 46-year-old George Clooney was an Oscar winner, twice named People Magazine's Sexiest Man Alive, and one of the most recognizable people in the world. As Clooney's profile skyrocketed, so had the public's interest in who the eternal bachelor was dating at any given point, an aspect of fame George could do without. He dated a lot of non celebrities. He was linked to a woman who I believe was a ballerina. He was more recently linked to someone who won Fear Factor and was a cocktail waitress. Clooney's relationship with Sarah Larson would most likely be unreported to this day if George had his way. But circumstances beyond his control intervened. Sarah Larson was outed because the two were in a motorcycle accident in New Jersey. They were riding and were hit by a car. And that, of course, made big news because there was a 911 call and both of them had to go to the hospital. Clooney quickly recovered from the minor injuries as 2007 saw him continue his streak of pitch-perfect project selection. He had a third go around Vegas in Ocean's 13, but it was his tour de force performance in Michael Clayton that defied the expectations of even Clooney's biggest fans. He's playing uh, a Mr. Fix-It lawyer, somebody who's morally rotting from the inside, who is still dressed well, but has to do jobs that are killing him. Uh, to me, the perfect symbol of what goes on in Hollywood when actors decide to do something that just isn't up to them and isn't engaging their passion in what's happening. You're talking about Clooney finally figuring every aspect out, all the moving parts are working together, and suddenly, you have the rascal uh, who's radicalizing and awaking to corruption and wanting to do something about it. I think Michael Clayton is his finest moment so far. Michael Clayton earned Clooney his first Oscar nod for a lead role, an award that eventually went to Daniel Day-Lewis for There Will Be Blood. Ever the gentleman, Clooney told anyone who would listen that Day-Lewis deserved the honor hands down. Besides, Clooney had other concerns, like saving the world. If you've been lucky enough to survive uh, rape and torture and murder and your family's burned to the ground and you've walked for 30 miles through the sand and you survived malaria and AIDS and starvation and you're lucky enough to get to the, one of these camps that are in terrible shape, you should at least have the right to live.
One of his huge passions has been, you know, the, the controversy going on in Darfur. He started his own organization called Not On Our Watch with some of his Ocean Eleven co-stars to help battle uh, the, the genocide that's going on there, help the families who have been displaced kind of have some of the things that they need. Yeah, when George Clooney says that he's interested in helping in Darfur, he isn't just uh, writing a check. Uh, he'll get on the plane, try to get himself killed, bring his father with him on the plane. Right now we're standing here on the border of Chad and Darfur. A lot of bad things are happening over here right now. My father and I thought we'd come over and take a look for ourselves. George feels the worst thing anybody needs to see is an American movie star saying this is what needs to be done. Instead of doing that, he really wants to go there and see what he can physically do. He doesn't um, absolve himself or anybody else from taking the responsibilities that come with uh, enormous power and influence. This is a person who didn't have to talk about uh, the situation in Darfur. This is a guy, you know, who would certainly be better off um, not criticizing uh, politicians in some way because, you know, there's blowback. He actually enjoys mixing it up. He obviously understands that not everybody agrees with him, but he's never shied away from his points of view. In 2008, George Clooney was given the title of Messenger of Peace by the UN for his work in Darfur. Coupled with several heavy-hitting films, Clooney was fearful of becoming known as an issues guy. In a move to reinforce his playful side, Clooney directed his third picture, the screwball comedy about the birth of pro football, Leatherheads. He also re-teamed with the Coen brothers to play an over-the-hill federal agent in Burn After Reading a direct send-up of his Oscar-winning turn in 2005's Syriana. When we talk about George Clooney and the Coen brothers and uh, what he calls the three movies he did for them, the, his trilogy of idiots, um, the Coen brothers saw what I think people who are close to George or the guys he's playing ball with and hanging out with or anybody that knows him well over the years know that the idiot side of him is um, taking control. And the Cone brothers have an eye and an ear for idiocy. Is that goat cheese? Chevre. Yes, that is a goat cheese. Because I have a, a, a lactose reflux and I can't. You're lactose intolerant? Yeah, but or I can't. you have an acid reflux. They're different things. I know what they are. So you misspoke. Well, thank you for correcting me. 2009 turned out to be an even busier year for the actor. And a sentimental one. The series that made George Clooney a household name was in its final season. On March 12, 2009, Clooney stepped back into his scrubs one last time and said farewell to Dr. Doug Ross. As one chapter ended, another was beginning, and the press couldn't get enough. While attending the Venice Film Festival to promote his latest film, The Men Who Stare at Goats, George made his first public appearance with rumored girlfriend 30-something TV presenter, Elisabetta Canalis. The world's most famous bachelor was officially off the market, for the time being anyway. All the media attention surrounding his new relationship didn't seem to distract George. In the next three months, Fantastic Mr. Fox, The Men Who Stare at Goats, and Up in the Air were released. Up in the Air received critical acclaim. Casting the A-list actor in his film was a dream come true for director Jason Reitman. For seven years I wrote this movie for George Clooney, never presuming that he would actually say yes, but then he did. He's the perfect guy for the role, for obvious reasons, and I'm just thankful that he said yes. Sort of like guys who are really flawed and failed and think they have everything together. I, always, I don't know why, but uh, <laughs> they appeal to me, you know. Yeah, what the hell? Clooney's up-in-the-air performance was celebrated and went on to earn the actor his second Academy Award nomination for leading actor. George was at the top of the Hollywood food chain, and the power and influence that came along with that position was about to come in handy. On January 12, 2010, when a tragic earthquake devastated Haiti, George made one of his biggest humanitarian contributions. We have Joel Gallen again, who directed the 911 telethon and the Katrina telethon. He's really talented. And, uh, and we've been working uh, sort of night and day trying to, we've almost got the music acts put, put together and they're gonna do it in New York and uh, Los Angeles. He led the Hollywood relief effort by organizing the star-studded two-hour telethon, Hope for Haiti Now. The telethon we did in New York, um, we raised over 56, 57 million. Uh, it's, it's 
continuously going. I want to thank George Clooney. Um, so I uh, worked with George Clooney a lot putting that together. Also uh, Shakira, uh, everyone, Madonna, everyone who participated in that. From the genocide in Darfur to the Haiti earthquake, George has always taken the spotlight off him and put it on others who need attention. And his tireless human rights advocacy hasn't gone unnoticed. In August, the 49-year-old was honored with the Bob Hope Humanitarian Award at the 2010 Emmys. Well, first of all, this is obviously a very different award than getting something for acting. And, you know, it's, it's embarrassing because it's, you, you know, you don't want to be awarded for doing what you're supposed to do. Clooney continued to put his fame to good use in 2011. He kicked off the year with an intense focus on his next political project, the Sudan. He first met with President Obama at the White House to discuss U.S. involvement in the Sudan. Then he initiated the Satellite Sentinel Project, which uses satellite technology to monitor the border of North and South Sudan in an effort to avoid further war. And after a visit to the Sudan in his mission to prevent another genocide, George contracted malaria. Luckily for him and Hollywood, the activist actor made a full recovery. In June of 2011, as George's film career began to pick up speed, his two-year relationship with girlfriend Elizabeth came to an end. Just a month later, George was linked to another girl, former WWE wrestler Stacy Keebler. Once again, the press couldn't get enough of George Clooney and his latest squeeze. But George's new relationship wasn't the only thing garnering him major attention. For his political thriller, The Ides of March, George was celebrated as a triple threat, star, co-writer, and director. Honestly, it's embarrassing, because you don't ever want to do more takes on yourself than you do on the other act, because then you look like a jerk. So it's trickier than you think. For Alexander Payne's The Descendants, he was applauded for playing a man who tries to keep his life from unraveling during a family crisis. It's a coming-of-age film for a 50-year-old man. You know, it's sort of people figuring out how they're going to get along when some tragedy strikes, and I think that's what's sort of nice about it. The two films together received a total of nine Golden Globe nominations from the Hollywood Foreign Press. George was nominated as Best Actor for The Descendants and Best Director and Best Screenplay for Ides of March. Clooney is aces. I had been told by other directors that working with him was going to be a real dream, and it was. It was total pro. He's been doing it most of his adult life. Really funny, really gifted. They say very, very professional, and uh, I can't ask to have had a better uh, leading man. On January 15th, with girlfriend Stacy Keebler by his side, George won the Best Actor Golden Globe for The Descendants. After his win at the Globes, it seemed George was destined for Oscar gold. George later received two Oscar nominations, Best Actor for The Descendants and Best Adapted Screenplay for Ides of March. Never one to rest on his laurels, George got busy after award season. He's donning the triple threat hat once again for his latest passion project, The Monuments Men and will star alongside Sandra Bullock in the sci-fi thriller, Gravity. When looking at Clooney's life as a whole, both on screen and off, perhaps he isn't the last movie star so many have crowned him, but a new kind of celebrity. A man who takes his work very seriously while being able to laugh at himself. He's been given a lot of power and a lot of wealth and a lot of success throughout his life. And he uses all of those beautiful things to give back to the world, whether it's starting a country in Africa or helping someone cross the street. He's extremely generous. He'll always say the nightmare vision of his career, that it will be George, two times sexiest man alive on his tombstone. Uh, that won't happen. And it won't happen because of movies like Good Night and Good Luck and Syriana. I sound like I'm saying that he's doing everything right. Um, you know what? He almost is. He just really is doing everything that I would find an ideal for a person in his position. Clooney can go just about anywhere now. I mean, he's at the peak of his uh, handsomeness and the peak of his success. I hope he continues to make challenging films as a director. Um, and I also, I hope that he continues to subvert his 
his persona on screen. As Hollywood goes, this guy's at the top of the heap. 